it's one of those days where I just want to take something apart and see what's inside, see what makes it tick. And this happens to be the Anchor Powerhouse 2 400. Uh, I'll put its aliases in the lower third. But I'm actually making this video for myself. I wanted to get an answer to a nagging question that I've had for probably about two years, which is, can I replace the internal fuse for the inverter if it were to open due to an inductive load running on it or something like that? Because I had one fail that, that way, where the hear the fuse pop and Anchor replaced it under warranty, but it, well, great, what happens when it's out of warranty and that same thing happens? Now, I've had this one for over two years, and I just know not to, you know, don't plug in your refrigerator into a 300 watt inverter. I knew it was a long shot when I did it, but you know, the running load of the refrigerator is about 220, 220 watts, but it has a huge inductive inrush. So I kind of figured that would happen. Uh, in this, this case, the powerhouse two warned me several times where it shut itself off and I kept turning it back on again. I think after the fourth time I turned it back on, the fuse got hot enough that it, it popped the fuse. I'm just gonna walk through how I got this opened up and some things to really pay attention to if you're going to go about opening it up. It's, it's one of the earlier ones in the myriad of power stations that are out there now. So this one is a bit different and to, to open up, in my opinion, than the ones I've seen online. And I've not seen anybody open up the Powerhouse 2 400. I've seen the, the original Powerhouse 400 and the 767, not this or the Powerhouse 2 800, which I also have. My expectation is that if you can follow along how to open this one up, you'd be able to open up the Powerhouse 2 800 as well or the Powerhouse 2 300. I think there even was a Powerhouse 250 or something. They did a bunch of different variants of, the, of this. It's a similar structure and assembly, so I'd expect it to open in a similar way. But your mileage may vary based on what variations are in manufacturing. Let's start with getting this thing opened up. So we're gonna ignore all the fun bits for a second here and just look at the back of this. And I'm gonna kind of loosely place all the pieces back on. I'm gonna have it angled up against a a pillow. I have other projects going on and yes, it was not the best idea. I do not recommend doing this on your living room floor. Sometimes projects just start here. So this is the back loosely, <laughs> what it loosely looks like. So there's this back panel. Don't be tempted to try to pry from the front, pry from the back. And you're not going to pry around what looks like this. You can kind of see it here. There's this plastic back piece, like decorative plate. And then there's an inner lip and then there's an outer lip. You don't want to pry in between these two because there are a bunch of screws holding this inner plate down. So you're just gonna be in for a headache. You want to pry in between the decorative outer plates and the inner plate. And it's not easy. You gotta be patient. And I had to, I used a bunch of different pry tools. I even broke a spudger. Well, it's not really, really that good of a spudger, but here it is and it actually cracked the tip of it off. So what I ended up doing, and it bent the other side too. I ended up using this tool and you can see it actually bent it a little bit too. And it was enough to get this plate, you could pry it up and you could see on the back that there are a lot of clips. There are five on the bottom, five on the top, and two on each side. And eventually this whole thing cried up and then I started sliding in wide flat blade screwdrivers into it to basically get it to stay popped open. This piece then popped off and then I worked on getting the LED cover off as well. And then that, that one was, was easier. It was only held in by another five clips and one on each side, but the bottom is open. So you're just kind of gently pushing this away, lifting it away here from the LED. And you want to be careful. I'm not sure if this is a cob array or not. It seems like it might be. I'm not going to dissect this because I want to, I want to keep using this, but you want to lift up and try to get along the edges so you don't actually lever onto the plastic damage that. So once you have that out, there are a bunch of screws. There's 10 screws that are security torques. And I just use my kit here to find the, it is a T10H. Once all those screws are off, it just comes straight off. When you remove this, you'll want to kind of prop it backwards because there is a connector right here. It's for the, that uh, it's a pretty long cable. It runs from the inside there all the way across. Through. It runs through kind of the fan assembly and then out the back. I, I've pulled it back so I can 
pull this part out, but you'll need to disconnect this. And it's not elastic down or anything, you can just remove it and then set this part aside. Next thing you're going to see inside here is the battery and the inverter, the DC to DC inverter assembly. And then the BMS, which I'll show you in a second, which is on the front side, on this side of the battery. This has a lot of connections, some of which are easy to access, some of which are not. The first thing I would do is disconnect this, which disconnects this main board from the battery management system. But it only disconnects this main board. There is still power flowing through through another XT60 connector on this side that goes to the front board here. And you can't get to that one until you actually move this back far enough and disconnect some connections. You don't wanna drop anything, obviously metallic, but there are four screws, two on this side and then two on this side that hold the battery assembly in. There are also another four screws. Man, this plastic is still heavy just with, the, with no battery in it. There's also four more screws on the bottom that hold the battery in. So you wanna remove all eight screws to release the battery. And then it's just a matter of disconnecting the connections. The first one to remove is the 120 volt output here, or 110 volt output, which connects right to here. Then the next one that I removed was this one, which actually plugs into the, into the BMS. It's the main board to the BMS communication. This is kind of short. You kind of got to weasel it in there and. I'll come back and tell you how difficult it was to get it back on there in a bit. The next one here is the main board. This goes to right down here. I think it's just all the communication and what is this? It actually says all the stuff. Yeah, five volt battery, ground, a UART to the battery, comm set and key minus key plus. I don't know what key minus key plus means, but it's referenced quite a bit around this thing. So I'm not sure what that would mean specifically. There's also a connector here I thought I needed to remove. It goes to the fan, but you don't need to remove it. Then I think that's pretty much it. Oh, no, there is one left. There is this one. This is the other fan, which I'll show you in a second. It actually is back there. And, and the best way to get this out is to rotate the battery and the assembly out this way so you can get in behind here and see everything up here and remove things that you need to remove. These two connectors I left, uh, well, this one obviously came out off on the PCB side or on the uh, inverter side, but the other one is elastic down pretty good. So I didn't want to mess around with trying to get that one off. So I just slid the cable back so I could move this out to show what's going on. And then obviously the, the last XT60 connector or the second XT60 connector. And then that's it. There's no more connections left. You'd be able to get this thing out at least to the length of this wire, which is what I did because I don't want to go any further than that because uh, I want to put it back together again and it would require some more disassembly here to get this all to be completely free. I'm not taking the PCB off because I want to use this thing again and it's zip tied down, leaving it alone. But we'll look at the, the main board here and it gotta say this whole thing is very modular and very well built. I don't know how else to say it. I'm, I'm actually impressed beyond what I thought I'd be. Just starting with the enclosure, you can see that there's a lot of internal bracing on the plastic to really keep it from torquing and to maximize its rigidity so that if you were to drop it or something like that, it wouldn't cause this to crack or damage things internally. And you can see where they actually put a spacer. I don't know what you call this in the mechanical engineering realm, but I'll call it a spacer to basically bring everything in by this gap. So you're, you're padding everything in so that parts and pieces are not touching the actual outside of the enclosure. Everything is separated by at least the height of these rails, which is really slick. So let's go all around. We'll look at the inside first. The front side, this is the side that's facing with all the buttons and the control electronics. You got your outlet down there. It comes through here, goes through a choke, a ferrite, and then it comes out to connect to the main inverter PCB. The rest of what we got on here looks like there's 12 volts going in, and then it's internally converted to the USB, three USB ports here. So it's bucked down to five volts through for USB. And then you've got, I think a buck regulator. You got two things split here. You got one, I think that's going for the USB-C port and the DC barrel jack in. So there's a DC in, and I think that's coming up here. I think that's what this is for. 
It actually might not be. It's hard to tell because you can't really re see every, everything underneath this, uh, this all this all this elastic here. My guess is this is either the input. Does it wrap around the side there? It does. So this is the input down here. I'm pretty sure. Let's just double check that. Yes, that's uh, the USB-C port, and then right next to it is the DC barrel jack. So the DC barrel jack is right here, and the USB-C port is right here. You can charge it from both USB-C and from the DC barrel jack, so it's, it seems that they would share similar control functionality. Probably with a USB-C controller I see down there, maybe. Not quite sure, but there's something down there. And then it's off, it runs off here, out to this connector to provide power back to the main board, to the BMS, to charge the battery ultimately. Or pass through to this to provide power to, if you're charging this via solar or something like that, or even just by the DC plug, you could plug things in via USB or you can't via USB-C on this on this model, but USB and you can charge things via USB or I think you can run the, you can even run the inverter, but I mean, it only charges at 60 watts, so you wouldn't wanna be plugging in a huge amount of load on it. That's basically, this side, power-wise, you've got the DC barrel jack as well for 12 volt, 10 amps. And then it looks like the main controller is here. STM32. It's an F0, STM32 F0. So it's a low, low power microcontroller, but still pretty capable for what it's doing here. And that I imagine is, is handling all of the control functionality on this side, not BMS or, it might do some light charge controlling, like, hey, okay to charge, not charge, that sort of thing, but it's not doing battery management stuff. We'll get to that in a second. But then you come over here, you want to do anything on the AC side or the charging side, you've got your inverter here. So on the DC side, we've got basically the battery voltage coming in here. It goes through a 40 amp fuse. That's the fuse that I believe opened. It is soldered through, but you can remove the board, desolder this, and then populate it with a 40 amp fuse. Some ball capacitance here, a big step up transformer. So this is going from about 16 ish volts to 110. And then it gets a bunch of diodes. It's like there's a rectifier on this side, but I don't know why you'd want... Oh, I know why. Because you're stepping this up and then you want to get a stable high voltage DC supply. So this is then rectified. I believe this is just going to high voltage DC and then this helps smooth it and then get it up to basically, it's not 170 volts DC, but it's high voltage DC. And this is rated 250 volt. It's Acorn or Acon ball capacitor, and then it's running through this stage, which is your pure sine wave inverter, which has a one-to-one -one transformer here. I believe it's just an isolation transformer. Or this might be your isolation transformer too, but I think this might also, but you got, I don't think this is a common mode choke. This one definitely is a common mode choke to reduce common mode noise. And then you've got an X cap here, and then two Y, I don't know why there's two Y caps here with ferret beads. I mean, it's really not, good attention to detail. These might be, I don't know what these are for, because there's no ref, this is floating. This whole thing is floating. There's no earth reference to this at all. Not even the input plug to charge it is referenced to earth. It's just reference. it's a DC barrel jack and the plug is just a polarized plug. So I, there's a ground wire going here all the way back. It snakes all the way back to the input, but I don't know what it's doing. Um, if you guys know, let me know because there's no ground reference on this whole thing, which is different than some of the higher output ones. So you've got good heat sinking, uh, some supported componentry on here. I do believe on the underside of this, there is another controller. Did I see a crystal? Yep, there is. I, I, there's multiple controllers on this thing. So there's another controller there, which I'm not gonna pull the board off to show, but yeah, this is responsible for the inverter itself. So it's nice that things are modularly done. You're not trying to get one microcontroller driving everything. So you got something driving all the DC stuff in kind of the front end. You got the inverter and the inverter controller, and it might have its own discrete ASIC or whatever that's driving the, the pure sine wave inverter side. And then beneath it, you've got all the batteries. And I'm gonna flip this around. No, let's do it the other way. I'll show the BMS in a second. I wanna show the fans first. So there's actually two fans in here. The whole time I've had this, I, I thought it was just one fan, but there is a fan dedicated to cooling the batteries, which is really neat. And then this fan, which I could sort of see through the louvers, that cools the inverter. If you watched the video I did on the Powerhouse or Power Station 757, or the, I think it's called the F1200 now, the Solex F1200, it does seem like Anchor took this design and just kept scaling it up because that one has four fans, two for the batteries, two for the inverter. They kind of adopt a similar thing where it's a two-level design. It's the all the inverter electronics on the top, 
and the batteries on the bottom. Now you can really see through the unit without taking it apart, kind of what's going on. Here's the battery information. I couldn't find the battery references. There is a designation on the side of the battery, a part number. I'll show it here, but I can't find what that pertains to for a battery. Got another ferrite here on the, I think this is coming from the input. Oh, input to the battery for the inverter. And then we have an, obviously have a choke going out to wherever you're powering. And that's both to, to provide noise-free power to the device, but also to protect it from noise being backfed into the system when it's running. Last but not least is the BMS, which I do not believe is made by Anchor. It is a kind of off the shelf, but still I'm sure capable BMS. This is the tricky bit here if you're, man, I, would, I really hope you watch the whole video if you're gonna take this thing apart before doing it. This is exposed. So if any screws or anything fall inside, you really got to be careful that they don't roll and touch this because this is live. Even if you have everything disconnected, the BMS is still alive. Perhaps if it's not being communicated with, this side is shut off because this is the balancing side, but you still don't want to be touching it. I have to look up these parts, but it does have, I believe, electronic fuses. There's two of them, one here and one here. So if, if stuff goes real bad, it'll pop those fuses and shut it off um, and shut down the, the BMS permanently to protect the batteries. So you really got a belt and suspenders approach here. You've got the unit itself, which will try to shut things down if there's an overload. There's an actual 40 amp fuse on the inverter. And then there's also a, f a set of fuses, I believe electronic fuses that will cut out if the unit has a catastrophic issue. I am gonna pull off this cover. Beneath that cover, it looks like there's your controller and they wanna obviously protect that. And then there is your sense resistors, which are right here for current monitoring. This does have a mark on it. This is Blue Way. So my guess is that another company is making this particular board for Anchor, which I think I've seen that before. I think I've seen it. I can't remember where I've seen it, but I think I've seen Blue Way before in other Anchor products. Why reinvent the wheel? They've got a, what is this, four? This might be 4S. I forget the combination of this. I'll put it on the screen, but... If you've already got a pre-built thing, you might as well just make it and put it in here. You don't need to make your own. And this does have two sets of leads coming out of it. One that goes back to the, the front of the unit there, and it has the other one that goes to the back that plugs into the inverter. Overall, it's pretty well built. I'm, I'm impressed. Um, obviously, it's not being made anymore. And they're going, they've moved from lithium ion batteries to lithium iron phosphate, which I think is a great move because they last longer and they're less prone to getting angry. This is the Powerhouse 2 400. Hopefully it gives you some idea of how to get it apart, if should you need to. Now I'm going to try to put it back together, and I will come back to let you know how that went.